and closed captioning closed captioning is also available uh, so you can enable captions by clicking the cc button at the bottom of your screen Um, so before we get started with William, I'm just going to briefly outline some session norms for these sessions. We've divided them into a few different categories. So under equity of voice and learning, we have take space, make space. So that means as a participant, please be mindful of any privileged identities you may hold and help to create an environment for everyone to contribute. And then speak from your own personal experience. So let's own our statements and views about things and not presume to be able to speak for others. And then under how we show up for ourselves and each other, we have openness to learning. So an understanding that we're all learners in this space, uh, flexibility and patience, things may not always go 100% according to plan, and sometimes technology is at play. So we thank you for your grace and flexibility. We'd like you to use the chat box mindfully so try to make your questions and comments as relevant to what we're talking about as possible and also a measure of confidentiality take away lessons but not personal content we'll sometimes knowledge share and co-share ideas and resources in these sessions but if anyone shares anything personal we ask that you don't bring it out of the space so without further ado i'd like to hand it off to william estrada and have him guide us through today's session Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, my name is William Estrada. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing space with us today. Um, I'm super psyched, a little bit nervous, uh, but more than um, uh, excited um, to engage in this, you know, conversation and you know, thinking about how do we intentionally. Um, go through this process right um what we're going to be doing is we're going to move into the goals for today um you know as it's been mentioned already this is part one of two um uh, professional development workshops that we're going to be doing today i'm going to be talking um through how i've gone through this process and really showing the examples that i've done um in kind of complicating and finding my own uh, way through this work that now I understand being uh, centered around social justice and culturally relevant um, curriculum. Um, but part of the session design for this is, you know, to think about familiarizing ourselves um, with educational frameworks that support individual development and critical social justice curriculum. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to identify and gather social justice art making resources that we will collaboratively uh, develop. And I will also share the resources that I've developed over my 20 years um, that will directly implement uh, your own teaching practice. Um, and then we will also um, begin to engage in discussions around how we can understand how to build uh, an educational practice that um, around creating lessons, asking critical questions of ourselves, of each other, of our students, that will help us make connections to contemporary artworks, exhibits, and sites of practice. And then my goal um, is for us to establish a shared resource bank of dynamic critical social justice curriculum that we will be contributing to and taking from um, in order to expand our practice. Um, this was going to be today is going to be really introduction to the room. So to, I'm going to invite you to uh, put your names on the chat. Tell us where you're joining us from. Um, you know, even possibly a question, right, of why you're you're interested in being part of this conversation and are present here today. Um, if you're part of an organization and it's not listed in your name, I would invite you to add that to the chat as well. Um, we will be defining what you know, I'm going to be defining what social justice art education is to me and cultural relevant art education. Um, we will go through the process of walking you through my teaching practice. Um, then what I'm going to ask you is to engage in these discussions around the frameworks that I'm going to present to you. 
and then we will create a manifesto of sorts to create um, the spaces for us to learn. I will share some resources um, and then I'm going to invite you to think critically about what kind of curriculum you want to generate. And then the second session is really going to be for us as a working group to develop um, curriculum that we want to share and, and dive deeper into. Um, next slide, please. The first thing that I'm going to ask to do is um, the way that I've been defining um, culturally responsive curriculum is I'm using this image today by International Bureau of Education of UNESCO um, and um, New America, right, around the eight competencies for cultural responsive uh, teaching. And really, it's a curriculum that respects learners' cultures and prior experiences. Uh, it acknowledges and values the legitimacy of different cultures, not just the dominant culture of society, and encourages intercultural understanding. That's going to that's been one of the things that has been guiding my thinking. Uh, and again, I'm still always attempting to define and redefine what this means within the context. Right. Uh, next image, please, Courtney. Uh, the second piece is coming around. Um, the um, white paper, the National Art Education Association position paper um, that they ended up defining social justice art education around um, artists and cultural organizations often engage with the issues of their time and some treat the creation and or curation of art as social practice. Art can provide a meaningful catalyst to engage and empower individuals and communities to take action around the social issue. The processes by which people create and interact with art can help them understand and challenge inequities through art education and social justice. So those are the main definitions that I'm working with today um, and have been working with in attempting to define the work that, I'm, that I want to do and I continue to aspire to do um, with, um, with my students and my colleagues. Um, next um, image, Courtney. So this has been a graphic that I've been using um, over the last like two years or so, and it's a graphic created by Dr. Patricia King around the multiple intersections around um, specifically, specifically social justice, art education, right, around awareness raising, and then moving into critical consciousness. Um, and I've been really thinking about this in terms of how is it that I am becoming aware of issues that are pertinent to me and pertinent to the students around me and the things that are happening um, in my city, in my neighborhood, in the world. But then also, like, how do I start becoming and moving into critical consciousness of my actions, whether they're small or big? in my own personal life, but then also in the way that I teach and the way that I'm thinking about teaching. Um, Courtney, if you may move to the next one, please. So the frameworks that I've been trying to define for myself, and these are, th these are still a, a live working document, right? Um, but these are the four frameworks that I've been working through, and um, I'll show you a little bit about how that how I've come to, to define these. But the first one is artist representation, which is emerging, you know, having artist representation, even within the lesson as the first step, right? Uh, really, really thinking about how we can um, engage in social justice and, you know, really think about cultural relevancy. The second part is developing, which is a teacher guided art project that model art as a research tool. And I really, really think about um, art as a research tool for many reasons and the complexities of like the devaluation of teachers, the devaluation of art making as something outside of the academic realm within public schools and just in general education. Um, so I really try to position art as a research tool. Um, even if it's playing, right, because playing is research. Uh, the third one is strong, right, which is student generated art projects that model art as a research tool used to address society and its uh, inequities or celebrations, right. Um, 
which are really coming from the students and things that students are interested. And then the fourth one, it's excelling, right? Which is really reimagining our curriculum to really think about the critical aspects of teaching uh, and learning, um, both as adults and as facilitators, but also with the students that we're working with that center art as a research tool, which analyze historically marginalized histories or stories. Um, and these have been the four the four kind of um, frameworks that I've been working through the last 25 years, um, sometimes intentionally, a lot of times really unintentionally. Uh, but with this uh, constellation residency, it's really helped me um, frame them. And then obviously the emerging, developing, strong and excelling are also um, frameworks, right? That ingenuity and the CPS Arts Department and Chicago Public Schools have been using to help us think and frame arts education in the city. Uh, next one, please. Teaching as learning. So my own teaching practice has really been influenced by um, the students and the places that I've been learning with, right? Um, I really have to, I've been working as a teaching artist for the last 25 years. I've worked as a visual arts teacher. I'm a certified um, art educator with a license in, in K through 12. Um, I'm currently um, faculty at UIC School of Art and Art History, where I do teacher training. Um, and I've been a teaching artist for the High Park Art Center, for Urban Gateways, ART, um, um, the, the um, oh my goodness, Chicago Arts Partnership Education, um, a lot of my work through the National Museum of and Fine Arts. I've been doing a lot of this work from prose arts, right? Jean Parisi, um, um, Oh my goodness, the names are like spacing on me right now, you know, but Jean Parisi, Elvia Rodriguez, and Kaya Overstreet were really the folks that created a foundation for me, right, in, in the work that I've been doing, and that work has been expanding as my collaborations and, and work has expanded with the multiple organizations that I've worked with. Um, Courtney, if you may, for the next one. I've been working at, at the Bochcali Elementary School as a teaching artist for the last 20 years as well, where they really helped me ground my philosophy and put it together that with arts integration through Chicago Arts Partnership and Education, but then also through uh, Mexican culture specifically and through language, right? As a dual language school, I was really um, challenge to think about teaching in a completely different way that I had been taught to to teach. Um, and it was always, it wasn't always intentional, but it was always with the um, focus of centering students' lives, right? And their experiences and celebrating what home meant to them, what family meant to them, and to celebrate the complexities of their lived experiences. Courtney, if you may, for the next one. One of the things that I've been doing is that really thinking about not only challenging my own notion of what art making is, but also what learning is and blurring these lines of teacher slash facilitator with the student. Right. And the roles that we play amongst each other and how we influence each other in creating these learning environments. Um, Courtney, the next one, please. Um, a lot of it has been really stemmed in curiosity and centering students and myself, right, as knowledge creators and thinking about how do we imagine ourselves in positions of power? How do we use power? to change our own experiences? How do we use power or misuse power, right? In modeling the things that we want for ourselves and the things that we want for the people that we call family, for the people that we call neighbors, for the people that we call um, um, our community, right? And um, Courtney, if you may go to the next one, please. And how do we start thinking about storytelling in weaving these experiences that allow us to engage in these complex conversations about 
who is celebrated, whether our stories are represented in the history books that we teach, uh, in the history books that we're learning from, and also in the experiences that we see um, in media, right? And in the books that we read. Um, Courtney, in the next one, please. A lot of the work that has been guided through these conversations has been also um, framed from a from a point of reference for myself of my own self discovery right um as a child of undocumented um uh undocumented workers um my experiences um in both southern california and guadalajara jalisco mexico and here in chicago and chicago public schools wasn't always represented and there was a lot of invisible labor right that um was around me that wasn't necessarily celebrated and wasn't seen or valued right so a lot of these conversations growing up art education was the space that allowed me to critically think and critically ask uh questions about why these stories weren't centered in the curriculum that i was being taught growing up and even in within the art education program and the art education uh, experiences that I started um, that I started engaging with after graduation. Um, uh, next, please, Courtney. And a lot of these were really about self discovery, right? Like not only my own self discovery as an educator, but also thinking about how could I push beyond the limits of art for art's sake and really think. Although I think that is really important you know, but really think about this aspect of playing around with ideas uh, with students, with other teachers, with other artists and myself, and thinking about ways that we might be able to generate conversations about using art as a tool to ask questions, right, which is really the framework for, for um, that CAPE has been using for, for a really long time. Um, and this aspect, the arts integration that I was doing in schools with other organizations and with students were really centered about exploring ideas around placemaking, who des decides, right, like what urban landscapes look like, how can we influence those ideas, what resources exist in our neighborhood, what resources are lacking in our neighborhood, and really helping um, create these opportunities for both myself, the students and the teachers that I'm working with uh, to imagine what kind of spaces we want to build for ourselves and why are these spaces important to create. Uh, Courtney, if you may. And a lot of these discussions have really been challenging and continue to challenge the way that I see education, right? Sometimes these opportunities are really um, presented kind of in, in a very serendipitous moment, right? Just by chance. Uh, sometimes they're very intentional. And then sometimes they're really out of a necessity to try to address the trauma or the historical erasure of people's stories, right? And there's no particular like right or wrong way that I've done this. But what I do acknowledge is that these experiences have always been um, you know, have always been very impactful to me, you know, and I hope that it, they're also impactful to the students and the teachers that I get to work with. Um, Courtney, if you may. A lot of these have also been really around um, playing with this concept of putting ourselves in positions of the other, right, and otherness. How do we become uh how do we become the other in conversations and then how do we other other folks right um and really exploring these concepts uh, through art making that we then begin to really start situating our own experiences with the experiences of others um our own relationship to the environment our own relationship to our stories and our traditions and the way that we start thinking about how stories are formed, how traditions are formed, and how do we get to represent and create knowledge of our, our own experiences and how do we put that knowledge out into the world? Courtney, if you may. A lot of these conversations have really been 
um, you know, sometimes, you know, in, in this, I, I try to see it as a play of, of exploration and playfulness um, where we have an intended outcome, but we're not sure how we're going to get to that intended outcome, you know, and a lot of those pieces have really been focusing on learning from the students, from the teachers that I'm working with, getting to know and develop trust, getting to, to develop relationships, um, and sometimes just also just being very transparent, especially for, um, for those residencies where I'm only there for a couple of days, right? Being really intentional and, and, um, and transparent about my own intentions and the way that I want to teach and learn with others. Uh, next one, Courtney. Um, there's also been discussions around, you know, how do we start integrating and, and thinking about how other forms of learning within the schools. In this case, um, this is a collaboration with a science teacher, Liz Pagan at the Bocchali, um, looking at the work of Nicole Marroquin and Paulina Camacho Valencia, and thinking about using research as ways to not only deconstruct what already exists, but also start to imagine um, those resources, uh, you know, try to imagine those resources for just futures, right? In this case, we're like redesigning and planning our own homes and thinking about how we might be able to use the resource that already exists without displacing the people from the neighborhoods and thinking about gentrification um, to really reclaim the spaces that we call home. Right. And all of these become these opportunities, not only for the students to reclaim art as a tool for imagining just futures for themselves, but also for myself as a teacher, right, to rethink what art can you can be used for and how I can think about teaching in in not only inspiring my future self and the hopes of, you know, what we can create together but also it pushes me a little bit closer, right, to thinking through how we can address the trauma, the historical trauma that we experience in using art making as that space for us to begin um, healing. Um, next one. We've also been like exploring um, historical aspects, right, of how art has been used um, within the historical context, in this case, Arpilleristas um, from the, that came together during the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile in the 1970s mm -hmm. to really think about, you know, how artists are using art as a way to address the injustices that are happening and for them to start also thinking about how do we come together uh, as a collective and use our collective power to reimagine the spaces that we live and work um, and live and work in. Uh, next one, please. In thinking about how we might be able to use um, the work that exists in our everyday lives, right? For us to start, again, rethinking about objects and the meaning of objects, the history that objects hold and the work that we are working towards in creating these objects that have meaning for us, but then also transfer that meaning through the stories that we tell with others. Next one, please. And really start thinking about the production of images, the production of, um, of, of theater, right? The production of puppets, the production of knowledge in ways that help us read stories, understand stories, and think about the different possibilities of it, right? In this case, I'm really influenced by the work of um, Augusto Boal and Theater of the Oppressed and really thinking about image theater, right? Um, to imagine different ways of solving problems, retelling the same story through different lenses to try and figure out how we as practitioners, as, um, as civic um, agents, right, can begin to interrupt harmful practices, how we can start to re 
imagine how we can critically engage in these really hard and complex conversations and think about our own responsibility in the questioning, but also in the way that we think of ourselves as engaging in problem solving, which is not always the case, right? As adults or as young learners. Uh, next one, Courtney. And then of course, you know, which I think is the most, like one of the things that I'm like most known of, known for, right? It's like the creation of posters and like these public engagements, right? Where we're inviting people um, to engage with these ideas and thinking about poster making, um, postcards, des designing pieces, right? That really invite an audience to engage with some of the thoughts and some of the research that we are interested in engaging with. Next one, Courtney. Lately, I've really been thinking about public spaces and reclaiming public spaces, spe specifically spaces that are often ignored, right? Within public schools, within public spaces, um, in neighborhoods, and imagining, right? Like, what would it mean for us to bring attention to these forgotten spaces, to beautify them, but also to start thinking about ways that we might be able to um, rethink about our own agency and power in engaging in conversations that are sometimes very hard, but can also bring this creation of collective knowledge, right? Um, and I think one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is that there's these simple acts of painting, of performing, of singing, of, of making something in places where there might not be an expectation for this artwork or creativity to exist in that then interrupt, right, the everyday lives of individuals, but also bring curiosity and an expectation of like, well, why isn't this work happening here, right? And I'm particularly interested in exploring these concepts, which have been new, right, um, in the last couple of years, to really start thinking about where our education happens. Right, and the fact that it does not have to be contained within four walls in a classroom space, right? But the fact that they can happen anywhere and everywhere that we exist and everywhere where we live. Courtney, next one, please. Um, and also thinking about you know these ideas of collective um, creation, right? Um, my my my. Um, my path through this work started through mural painting a long, long time ago. Um, I don't paint as many murals anymore, um, although I do wish that I could paint more, right? Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I started learning about is just the complexities and the, you know, navigation, right, that we go through in assigning roles and trying to figure out what are the things that we bring to the conversation, right? What do we feel comfortable doing? What do we feel more challenged in doing, right? And this constant navigation in the relationships that we form to create something together, you know? And I think just very much like performance, right? Where we're constantly nav navigating the spaces that our bodies take, that our voices take, that our presence uh, takes, right? We're constantly navigating these learning opportunities through the performances that we're putting through um, and putting with with the students that we're working with or with uh, with the participants, and I think one of the things that I've been really excited about is an engaging in that right and creating these spaces where creating these brave spaces right that where we can be challenged where we can challenge and also think about why we believe the things that we believe. Now, there's going to be two different pieces. Courtney, if you may, with the next one. Uh, really quickly before we finish, um, you know, I just wanted to introduce um, a couple of different resources, right? The first one is Arte with Maestro William, which came out of a conversation with Joseph Spielberg at Chicago Arts Partnership Education 
um, in response to the pandemic, using play as a radical act. Um, and, you know, we ended up creating Arte with Maestro William, which really served as a way to um, think through and, 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 and play around with these ideas of what does it mean to, to as a cis brown male, right, uh, to be vulnerable, to apologize, to produce something that isn't polished, <laughs> uh, to make mistakes and apologize, to say, you know what, actually, I'm, I'm not sure what that answer is, right? Like, what does it mean to be vulnerable as, as adults, as, as teachers, as, you know, academics, right? When we are constantly asked that perfectionism is the key to professionalism, right? What does it mean to be vulnerable with each other, to play with each other, to explore ideas that we don't necessarily have the answers to, right? But it's the process of building something together that is the work, right? And the, the, the art that we make is the artifact of that process. Um, Courtney, have you made for the, um, so I'm going to invite you, I put the, the link to those YouTube videos for you to play around with and think about that process. The other piece is also um, uh, Puppets and Resistencia, which is a new project that I've been, that I've been working on. I was lucky enough to work with Jasmine Cardenas. Um, we got commissioned by the Illinois Humanities um, to create two puppets, uh, two puppet stories around um, interrupting um, incarceration in marginalized communities and really thinking, you know, this website that was just launched yesterday by the Illinois Humanities holds 14 artists and humanists that are thinking around these ideas, right? And some of this work is going to be um, work that I'm going to invite you to explore as we start thinking about the work and the frameworks where your work exists within these frameworks that, you know, their they're, they're guidelines, you know, they're kind of like meshed together. It's not that we have to fit into one or the other, but we're constantly doing them all together at once, right? But how do we start working, doing this work more intentionally? Um, and this is the amazing Jasmine Cardenas, um, you know, working with his videos. Um, next one. So we're going to come back to this idea of um, this graphic by Dr. Patricia King, right? And thinking about awareness raising and moving into critical consciousness. And what does that mean to us as individuals? So I want you to take a small moment, right? And just really thinking about where you are in this, right? You as an individual, um, whether you're here for yourself because, or you're here because of an organization that you're working with, thinking about our own work, right? The work that we have to do internally um, to, where, to raise awareness, um, to think about exposure to diversity and what is our own exposure or lack thereof right? What are those critical incidents that shape the way that we think, right? What is the self-reflection that we are doing? Um, and how do those converge, right? To create those aha moments where the little light bulb and that spark generates that excitement and that hope of like, I finally understand it after so many years, right? Just to like briefly understand that and then like not understand it again, which is okay, right? That's part of our learning process. And then again, you know, the phase two of moving to critical consciousness, right? Around social justice action. What does that mean? Whether they're they're big social act social justice actions or they're small by the interactions that we have with each other, right? Um, intergroup relationships, how are our friends, our family, the conversations that we have with them, how are they matching the work that we're attempting to do with our students, and how are we attempting to live every day in our, the philosophy that we are attempting to teach in as well, right? To, again, merge into this idea of critical consciousness, right? And I think it's those two pieces that make this work sustainable. Um, not only for ourselves, but are for our sectors. And I think also is just, you know, the creation of these networks where we know that we are not alone in the work that we're doing. And we are creating this work collectively um, in ways that, you know, 
we are in shaming each other. We are, you know, supporting each other. We are reaching out to each other. Um, as I told someone just earlier on, right? Like um, early on this week, like we have to give ourselves the opportunity and the, um, the permission to reach out to each other and really think through um, how we can work to, to generate the spaces that we are gonna all thrive in and work through, right? And I think that's really um, something that I've learned from the many amazing people that I have in my life and the working spaces that I've been part of. They always haven't been perfect and they're not perfect by any means, right? But we're constantly working through that and, and really thinking about, you know, how do we heal and begin to address the trauma that we cause, right? Um, where was I? All right, thank you. <laughs> so right now, um, what we're gonna do is I wanted to, really engage in these discussions, what I was going to do is I was going to um, present a particular work or project that goes into these four categories. Um, and as part of this discussion, um, later on, we're going to actually break out into groups, um, into smaller groups where I'm going to ask you to create a manifesto of the spaces that you need, right, in order to continue to create this work or to help you generate this work yourself, right? Whether it's as an individual or within the, um, the, um, the organizations that you work in, right? And some of the questions that I want you to consider as I'm going through this, um, this presentation is, which approach is best for you right now, right? Knowing that whatever approach you are identifying my switch, right? Depending on the organization, depending on where you are emotionally, psychologically, right? Where you are in, in, in the space of the world at that moment. How are artists representative of the population you are teaching, right? Not only for yourself as a teaching artist, but also as the organization, how are you hiring um, teaching artists, right? How are you using or, or curating the work of artists that you present to your students as well, that you're using for inspiration for the programming that you're developing. How are the artists challenging the population you are teaching, right? Who's considered an artist? What are the types of art that are being showcased, right? What is the type of artwork that we are generating um, and how are we putting that work out and framing the students that we work with as artists in their own right, right? Um, and what my hopes for this is that as we go through this presentation and as we wait for May 3rd, which I'm gonna be really anxious and excited about as well, um, that we think about how we're using the curriculum you already have, the curriculum that you, intend to create, right? How do we plan on adding artists of the global majority that provide an opportunity for yourself, for your students, for the organization, right? To see themselves in the art making process and can also challenge, right? The notion of who is creative and where art can exist, right? And I'm hoping that we'll, we, we will create this bank of resources, right, that we will have access to for us to borrow and for us to contribute to in order to grow this work, right? And hopefully, you know, through this professional development, through this presentation and the one on May 3rd, right, you will give yourself permission and give others permission to reach out to each other so we can build this work together, okay? All right, next one, Courtney. So, emerging. So, you know, thinking about artist representation within the lesson, right? I know that when I first started teaching, I wasn't always super comfortable in claiming the programming or the curriculum that I was teaching. One, because I was just, you know, you know, I'm very shy, actually, you know, and, you know, I'm just super nervous, right? 
I also have a lot of imposter syndrome, but that's like uh, for another session, right? Um, but really thinking about who are we centering, right? How are the artists that you're showing representative of the population you are teaching, the teaching artists that we're hiring, the teaching artists that we're inviting into these conversations? And how are the artists challenging the population that we are teaching, right? Not only in the way that we're modeling compassionate care, not only in the way that we're modeling collaboration, the way that we're modeling, right? The complexities of our own experiences and the uh, experiences of our students, right? Um, if you may, Courtney. The first project that I ended up choosing was a collaborative um, arts integration piece that I ended up doing with um, a fourth grade teacher and what we ended up doing is we realized through conversation that we were really interested in thinking about portraiture. Students were really um, excited about this idea of like learning portraiture techniques. Um, so in because we were still trying to figure out what we were doing, this was a new collaboration. I wasn't too sure how to um, even teach portraiture, right? Um, this was still very early on in my teaching artist career. I was looking at the work of Frida Kahlo, um, you know, because Frida is Frida, right? She's super popular, controversial artist, but you know, that's again for another conversation. Um, I was looking at the work of Gabriel Garcia Roman, um, specifically thinking about his portrait um, project of queer icons, and then of course the work of Kehinde Wiley. Uh, next one, Courtney. For these particular projects that students did, um, we also started thinking about invisible labor within the neighborhood, right? We were really thinking about these concepts of what kind of jobs are students encouraged, right, to, to take on, and what kind of jobs are celebrated within the neighborhood, within society, right? Uh, and now, obviously, you know, there's, you know, the pandemic, there's been a huge discussion around essential workers and whether essential workers are actually essential, right? Like, are they paid like essential workers, right? Um, but at this point, you know, we were really thinking about just looking at portraiture as ways to honor. Um, at first, we were, we were just thinking generally like honor work that happens in the neighborhood. And then students were like, oh, well, I'm going to make portraits of my parents, right? Which we hadn't even you know, thought of, to be honest, right? Um, so we really started looking at these pieces. If you notice, right, we used the, the banner at the bottom, um, modeling after that Frida Kahlo portrait. We used the halos around for Gabriel Garcia Roman's queer icons. And those halos themselves are created using, uh, this is all mostly collage work, right? And transfers for from images. But the halos themselves are actually made up of symbols that represent the labor of that particular individual or that par particular labor, right? Um, if you may, the next one. And then, of course, you know, we really started thinking about the work of Kahine Wiley as the background, right? And 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 really thinking about the um, the um, the yeah the the layers and the the complexities of the background and how that generated. Um, how that was used as a symbolism for the individual itself. So what we ended up doing with a lot of these projects um, was really thinking about um, how we use portraiture to represent and, uh, and honor individuals. <clears throat> and this concept um, I've continuously used in different iterations. Uh, but what we started doing is really started thinking about the layers, right? Like the layers of the background, the layer of the head, the halo, the layer of the portrait itself, and then the layer of the actual banner, right? And the fact that all these different layers make up a small part, right, of this individual, right? And the fact that there's still so much that we do not know about this individual, right? And that we're not going to try to to deconstruct, right? But at this moment in time, like these are the layers that we are able to kind of excavate and we're able to kind of showcase as part of this work. Um, if you may coordinate with the next one. So um, this was done with a group of about 24 students, right? Like this was one class 
um, over a period of eight weeks. And what we really started thinking about was really using the resources of the artists to guide our thinking in analyzing the works of art, how they were thinking about portraiture and combining these different aspects of these artists to guide us in the thinking for the project that we were doing, right? And in this case, we started really um, playing around with these concepts of what these projects meant, um, who these people are. Some of the portraits were actually gathered from images that we asked students to bring in. Other portraits were, you know, we looked on, online and we started, um, um, you know, we printed images and other portraits themselves, you know, students ended up creating from memory. Um, one of the pieces that we really started thinking through was going through the process of just art making as a process but really thinking about you know centering the artist and the way that artists are choosing to represent um, themselves or individuals in this um within this context right um and this was something that we were you know that i was exploring and that i continue to explore and looking at the way that artists are thinking through their own practice as a way to represent the, you know, the individuals that they're choosing to create portraits of. Um, the next part is, um, you know, this, this second framework of developing, right? And, and, you know, using our own curiosities as teachers to guide students through these art projects. Right. Um, and this is where I was telling you, you know, earlier on that I was particularly interested in really framing art as a research tool for a couple of different reasons. Right. Uh, one was that I was realizing that, you know, growing up, I didn't always see myself in or or the stories of my family being represented in the art and the art making that I was that I was um, uh that I was being taught, right? Um, so really thinking about what stories are missing from the curriculum, um, whose voices are not present, right? Um, how can the artists that we are presenting begin addressing how art can be used as a research tool to address marginalized histories, right? What kind of stories do, would we want to create? What kind of stories would we choose to highlight and amplify that are not being told? Um, and then, of course, right, like how can we use art as a way to address the injustice present in our society, right, for us to um, create opportunities for students to see themselves as um, as the creators of, of solutions, right, to the problems that exist, and for us to also start thinking about different ways of imagining our, our way um, our way of interacting with each other and engaging with each other, right? So um, in this thing, you know, like really using the, the curriculum that we already have in, in these ways to think through some of the, the problems that, that, we, that we are engaging with. So in this particular project, we looked at the artists, uh, the, the, you know, three different particular artists, uh, Nick Cave, uh, Muliana and Yu John Choi, um, they use a lot of uh, like soft sculpture or sculptures as a way to generate um, ideas and to, again, help us frame the type of work that we were interested in, in generating. Because again, this was, this was, um, um, you know, this was, uh, we were, we were, I was presented with like, we need to talk about science, right? And we were we were meant to talk about um, cells, bacteria, and viruses, and make artwork around it, right? And I was just like, okay. I was like, I have no idea how to do that, right? Um, this was something that a teacher was interested in in working through, um, and and I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm not sure how to do this, you know, and and through the troubleshooting and trying to figure out what students what they were interested in learning we realized you know that there was this particular this particular um way of, of thinking through these problems to generate this project um corny if you may 
so what we started doing is we re really just started doing scientific illustrations, right? Uh, which are pretty common, right? When we're thinking about arts integration for science and art. Um, and what we started thinking about was that we started working through this process of thinking through, well, what would, if, if we were to give these cells, bacteria or viruses, a like characteristics, right? Like what would they say about themselves, right? What kind of stories would they tell about why they do the things that they do, right? So we ended up creating these comics. We ended up ger generating these soft sculptures, you know, plushies, because I was like a big plushie, you know, fan when I was a little kid. I still am, you know? It's like, and really thinking through these aspects of like where, where is the story of these plushies, right? So this is this is a cancer cell, right? And really thinking about the idea of what would a cancer cell tell you, right, um, about themselves if they had an opportunity based on the research that students went through in order to to um, for them to understand what a cancer cell does, right, and why it mutates um, and why you know it uh, takes over the body, right, um, and also like analyzing our own relationship to to cancer right and and the harm that it causes the the um, the way that you know we've we've been trying to think about that right and 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 the environment itself around us that caused these things to happen um one of the things that we've been really playing around with is is a, attempting to use play attempting to use um curiosity and and you know but more so than anything else like playfulness to engage in these really hard discussions right um not only for the students but also for us uh as teachers as adults right as authority figures like how do we start engaging in these discussions very serious and complex again very layered conversations through play right, through the curiosities, through asking questions that we ourselves are curious about. And one of the things that we've been discovering is that, you know, it's it's through this play that gives us the, um, it gives us room, right, to explore and to fail, right, which is a big part of the work that I've been, um, that I've been able to, to do, and that, you know, organizations, schools, teachers, students have allowed me to be part of that we have been playing together. And when there's failure, we're able to then regenerate or refocus, right? To try to learn from that failure and, and reframe the work that we're attempting to do, right? And I think that's a big part of the, um, the frameworks around social justice and culturally relevant curriculum and allowing ourselves to fail um, without causing harm or 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 addressing the harm that we that we cause right as a way to really start exploring and pushing the ways that we're thinking and the way that we're generating curriculum and our projects with others um corny do you mean so the third piece is, you know, this third, this third framework around student generated art projects, right? Um, and this is this is the this is my this is one of my favorite ones, but I think it's also the most challenging, right? Um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of trust, there's a lot of vulnerability that comes with presenting the opportunity to students to be like, hey these are a list of things that I know how to do. These are the things that I'm interested in exploring as an artist, as a teacher, right? What are you interested in doing? This is my budget for materials, right? This is the amount of time that we have, you know? What are you interested in doing in that amount of time, right? Um, one, because it takes a lot of practice for us to do that. It takes a lot of trust from the, from the teachers, the adults in the room. Um, both at the administrative level, you know, programmatically, and then for the teaching artists. And also it takes a lot of trust from the students, right? Um, and I think it's also, you know, something that we, that we have to, as teaching artists, I know, 
you know, it, it's taken me a long time to learn how to try and weave and understand the different things that teachers need, the different things that students need, and understand the work that I'm doing enough to be able to make those connections, right? Because um, I think they're not always, um, they're not always super clear, and they're not always very, um, they don't always fit very, <laughs> you know, very well, right? And we have to kind of adjust and make, make them kind of work based on the flexibility and obviously the, the program that we're teaching, you know, but, um, you know, this particular project is really thinking about, you know, how can we model art as a research to, again, to, to address society, but from something that students are interested in, in engaging with, whether that's a material or the subject matter, right? And the questions for this particular uh, framework is really thinking about inviting students to share things that affect their community directly by mapping the injustice, right? But finding what is the, I think sometimes we, focus on like the surface level problems instead of looking at the systemic structures that are creating those problems, right? Um, and I also, you know, learned from, from doing this and then obviously from, from making a lot of mistakes and, you know, from learning from other um, more, more experienced teachers, you know, that it was the mapping and looking a little deeper into the systemic structures that then alleviated my initial understanding of problems as being people generated, right? And saying, well, it's the people that have a choice in the choices that they're making, right? And blaming people in the neighborhood and really thinking about the systemic structures that have created of the resources that have been robbed from from specifically black and latino neighborhoods and just from poor people in general right um and thinking about why those systems have been created and the intentionality or the lack thereof right and in investing resources that create these larger problems um and really again you know framing these conversations around you know encouraging students to research artists who are using um art that addresses these same issues right and in this case i was having you know these long and arduous conversations disagreements i'm going to use conversations for this right around students playing with pokemon cards um because they're constantly like sneaking pokemon cards around right um and you know what we ended up doing was that instead of finding them through the the Pokemon cards, which I was like, definitely like, I was like, no, I'm the adult, you're gonna listen to me, you know, and a student was the one that was like, you know, instead of fighting with us, why don't you just let us do Pokemon cards? And I was like, you know, cause sometimes I forget that kids are awesome and have the solutions as much as I say that I'm the one that comes up with this stuff, right? Um, so what we ended up doing, I was like, all right, what if we create these, um, these Pokemon cards, right? But instead of having the, the Pokemon cards, like hurt each other, right? Like, how do we like generate like their power that solve something that's happening in your neighborhood, right? So of course there was like, you know, toxic farts you know, to, you know, like stun people, right? Um, there was uh, folks that were generating food. There was different types of conversations about what superpowers do, what superpowers can be used for, right? What is a superpower and why do people want that, right? Um, what are some of our fears, right? What are some of the things that we wanna change in our neighborhood? Um, in our family, in our everyday experience, in the school. Um, and we ended up generating these, um, these, these cards, right? That were doing the things that they love to do already anyway, right? But it also forced me to understand what Pokemon cards were, right? Like I had to spend some time doing some serious research, you know, on like the levels and like, why why is you know like why is this card more powerful than the other one right and i'll be honest i didn't quite understand all of it 
but students were more than happy to generate that knowledge and teach me, right, what it was that they were doing and, and, and how those, the, the cards that they were doing um, uh, related to the general, like, Pokemon world of, of characters, right? Um, and, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences, you know, it was frustrating, very frustrating at first, you know, and it's like, but afterwards, you know, once I had time to kind of like really think through this, you know, I was like, you know, this was really great. Like, why, why was I so resistant, right? To, to really following the lead of the students and, and, and have them generate curriculum. And this completely, completely changed the way that I started thinking about my own curriculum building um, and, and really starting with, with a concept of like, what, what are students doing? What are students, what do students want to do, right? So it doesn't become this constant negotiation. Um, well, it's always a negotiation, right? But it doesn't become this, this big negotiation of like, this is why this is important, right? And really thinking about these connections that we have with students and explaining them like, these are, this is the flexibility that I have right? These are the things that I'm supposed to teach you, right? Based on these standards, these are the things that I'm supposed to do in order to move on to these, um, these different aspects of art making, right? What are the things that you're interested in? How can we start making those connections? And I think for me as a teaching artist, it also really helped me understand, right? Uh, and push my own comfort zone as to what I was teaching and what I was able to, to teach. Right, which leads me to the fourth and the fourth framework, right, which is this um, completely redeveloping your curriculum um, around criticality, right, um, and under the framework of excelling, right, that really centers art as a research tool um, for both the teacher, for the student, that analyzes historically marginalized histories or stories through either celebration amplification of things that are already happening, right? By using art as a way to rethink how our art curriculum um, exists and how it can be used, right? To celebrate people's experiences, how it can complicate history, problematize it, right? How, you know, the things that we are taught to critically analyze problems that are present in our direct communities right? That's the other aspect of it, right? Like, I think sometimes we try to solve problems that exist in other spaces, but we don't have direct access to, right? So really thinking about our own experiences. So we're not trying to fix the problems that we, that, that don't necessarily affect us, right? Um, so then we really like move away from like, you know, um, becoming saviors from, you know, reflecting on experiences that we don't completely fully understand, but really thinking about our own privilege, thinking about our own um, situation within the spaces that we call a community, and thinking about what are those aspects, what are some of the problematic pieces that exist, right, um, that we can then create curriculum around. Um, centering artists of the global majority, right, to, to really frame um, and address the themes of the curriculum. And then, of course, one of my favorite things, right, to try and see how we might be, be able to invite other people to collaborate on, on, on these themes, right, whether it's within our, 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 you know, within other classrooms, with other teachers, whether it's with other artists, with arts organizations, organizations out in the community. Right. Um, if you may, uh, Courtney, let's see, I can double check on time. Not too bad, not too bad. I'm actually like walk, talking faster than I had anticipated. So this, this is good. So um, this was a collaboration and this has taken many iterations. Um, this was a collaboration with uh, Dana Osterlin Castellon. She's a social studies teacher. Um, she was already, she had been teaching Latin American history, you know, and, and for this particular uh, project, we had thought about, um, she was really interested in thinking about 
the displacement of, of folks from Latin America and the exodus that was happening, right? Um, from the 60s on to the 90s uh, and continues to, to happen, right? Um, of people and migrating to the US. So we started really thinking about uh, the Arpillerista movement, um, which was, if folks are, are not familiar with them, the Arpillerista movement was um, a group of women um, during the 1970s that were responding to the Pinochet dictatorship where um, family members were disappearing. So the Arpilleristas, um, mo mostly, not mostly, all of them were women, were creating these tapestries to not only document the atrocities of the Pinochet dictatorship, but also as a way to create healing circles, right? To address the, the injustices that were happening in their own in their own neighborhoods, in their own communities. Now, this was not necessarily, I did not know that this had happened. Um, later on, I found out that a lot of this work was actually being done. Um, you know, out in the open because it was women's work. Um, the the Pinochet dictatorship didn't really see it as threatening because it was women's work, right? And again, we can talk about the many layers of that as well. Um, and um, it was also being funded by um, by the CIA. So the U.S. didn't take much interest in covering um, what was happening at that time. So a lot of this work was actually being shipped to Canada um, and through um, the archdiocese in Canada where they were actually organizing exhibitions, which then brought uh, attention on the global um, um, on the global platforms, right? To, to really think about the human rights violations that were happening at that time. So we started thinking about collective work, right? How the Arpillaristas were coming together to not only heal, but to also think about ways of documenting people's experiences for, for others to see, for others to engage with, and to attempt to work through um, problem solving and, and work and identify solutions, right, for, for these problems. So in this case, right, like this is, students started really thinking about sewing, um, and we had other various conversations around like women's work, right? Spe specifically within, you know, the Latino culture, there's a lot of machismo, there's a lot of um, conversations around, you know, gendering, right? And thinking about what is appropriate for women to do, what is appropriate for men to do. Um, and all those conversations have been shifting slowly um, um, you know, they're still very present in, in the culture, right? So we started engaging in these discussions about sewing, the, the many processes of sewing and the importance of sewing, um, you know, using sewing as um, a way for us to really start doing self-reflection, as a way for us to um, kind of center ourselves through this act and this repetitive action, right? Um, but then also like thinking about, right, like, where, where is fabric coming from? How are we using this fabric to tell stories? Um, thinking about patterns. Um, and one of the things that we asked is that we wanted to use these arpilleras um, as ways for us to tell our own stories, right? Thinking about the things that we wanted to celebrate, right? And in this case, um, this was done with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Um, really thinking about, you know, in this case, right, like someone is actually creating a work of how their parents were um, migrant workers in the fields and how they ended up getting, um, they started packing everything to move to Chicago, right? Uh, Courtney, if you may, for the next one, please. In uh, this one, right, like they were talking about how their, uh, their parents, right, like would go see this student um, play soccer, right, and, and how meaningful that was for them, right, um, to celebrate the fact that, you know, their family members had been out working all day, right, and now they were taking this time to, like, just celebrate him, 
um, and, and something that he enjoyed, right? And this one, of course, there's like a communal birthday party and the fact that family would get together for these celebrations. And the fact that like now that this particular student was getting older, you know, that wasn't happening as much. And his intentions of, you know, making sure that as he got older, that he reminded people to come together and celebrate each other in order to be seen, right? Um, this one was really, you know, something that came close to me as someone growing up who, you know, completely rejected my own Mexican culture out of the need to assimilate and feel um, that I belonged here in the U.S., right? There was a lot of, you know, deconstructing and, and, and conversations with this particular student about seeing themselves as beautiful and, and reclaiming right um the historical knowledge that you know had has been erased right and 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 relearning um what makes this particular student amazing what the history of their parents um migration to the us and then also just like really thinking about um this this concept of brown is beautiful right um, and really looking at the civil rights movement, looking at the Chicano movement. Um, but again, ways of us to start to heal and, and think through these processes of, you know, why aren't our stories told? Why aren't our stories centered, right? Where do we search for these stories in order for us to feel whole and for us to feel as, you know, that we're part of this larger history, these larger stories that are constantly being told? Um, and, you know, this one particular, this is like the planning aspect of it, right, of thinking about, and behind it, it actually talks a little bit about like research, the artists that they're looking at, um, but thinking about, you know, for this one, it says, se trata de gentrificación, un problema social en nuestras ciudades, right, this is about gentrification, a, a social problem that's happening in our cities, right, and thinking about where the displacement is happening, um, who gets to afford to be in a neighborhood, who gets to claim a neighborhood um, and, and, and exist within it, and then who's cons con consistently being pushed out, right? Uh, if you may, Courtney. Um, this was a, a different iteration of that billetes. Um, for this particular one, we really started exploring the um, why people emigrate from their countries. Um, and really thinking about the different ways that people arrive to the U.S. specifically, right? Whether that's by car, whether that's by boat, whether that's through walking, whether that's through um, uh, airplanes, and the different ways that people end up in the U.S., right? Um, if you mean, Courtney. Um, we also talked about the, how hard it is to leave right, the places that you've called home for many years, right, and, and the reason why people end up leaving, right, whether that's um, because of war, because of economic strife, right, if that's because there's, um, you know, just lack of work, right, there's like economic dis um, um, instability, um, and the fact that people end up leaving for all multitude of reasons, you know, and then of course, you know, the realities, the harsh realities that people encounter when they arrive to the US, you know, um, um, and specifically in this one, this was in, in 2018. So there's a lot of rhetoric around um, immigration policy, right? And, and, and who, like who is seen <laughs> as, the problem in immigration, right? Um, and, you know, I was just, just before this morning, I was listening to um, uh, a speech that Angela Davis was giving, you know, around um, radical frameworks around social justice, you know, and she was just talking about how every time that there's immigration, right? Like Mexico's always like the the point, right? Of, of these discussions and, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, like even in the way that we're thinking about, you know, yeah. the war that's happening in Ukraine, right? And 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 the and the complexities, right, of war and displacement, and who is welcomed and who isn't, right? Um, which are very complex and very layered and very hard conversations to be had, right? Um, but 
this particular image really thinking about those pieces. Now, as we move on to some making, right? Um, I wanted to really invite you all to think through with me, you know, um, you know, what is professional development, right? <laughs> uh, this is, I really love this image, you know, it's like, and the fact that like, sometimes we frame professional development as like the solution to everything, right? It's like, this is it, like, this is, like this is the way to solve this problem, right? And the fact that like problems shift, right? Like ways of thinking shifts. Um, but you know, I, I really love this image. Um, you know, I know I really like to, whenever I'm doing this kind of work, um, whether it's with teachers, whether it's with young students, whether it's with um, colleagues, you know, I like to think about like, what is affecting you right now? And we try to make a huge list of all the things that are affecting us, both positive and negative, right? Of the things that are kind of on our mind. Um, so I'm gonna ask you, right? To like really think about, you know, the presentation today, what, what is um, some of the things that you're really interested in exploring, right? And the different ways that teaching can look like, right? Um, the way that you teach, might not be the same way that somebody else's teaches, right? So like really thinking about and recognizing your own teaching style and where you are in your teaching practice. Um, and also, you know, cause like straws were the, those I like so wanted one of those straws when I was a kid, you know, cause they're so cool. Um, Courtney, if you may. Um, and as organizations, right, as teaching artists working for organizations, as art educators within systems that already exist, right, uh, thinking about how are we centering the teaching artist needs, right? I think we always, we, we tend to frame education as the needs of the students, which are very important and, and part of this conversation as well, right? But as educators, what are our needs? Right? What are the needs of teaching artists? What are the needs of te uh, arts educators in these spaces? Right? How are we modeling the organization's philosophy in the way that we interact with each other, in the way that we train teaching artists, in the way that we support the teaching artists or the educators, in the way that we then model that for our students? Right? Corinne, if you may. And then how is it really mixing between theory and practice, right? So there's a balance um, in, in, you know, in practice, right? So we're not only practicing, but also theorizing and working towards this collective building, right? Of the programs that we wanna see, the, the, the curriculum that we wanna see, the relationships that we wanna see. How are we centering play in that for everyone involved, for the students, for the teaching artists, for the arts educators, right? For the administrators, right? How are we playing together, right? To not only make and create things, but to also problematize, right? And, and, and address the difficult aspects of the work that we're attempting to do, right? And the way that we're really thinking through these processes. Now, what I'm going to ask of you is we're going to be breaking up into um, breakout groups. Um, and I want you to think about these, these ideas of where you are at, right, in your own teaching practice, the reason why you chose to spend these, you know, two hours with us, right? Um, we're hoping, right, that you will come back and, and you know, join us May 3rd again. Um, but as part of this, right, like thinking about, um, I'm going to ask you to create a, a, a manifesto and I'm going to give you the opportunity to, or the choice of whether you want to do something individually, whether you want to do something collectively, um, but really thinking of the manifesto as a public declaration, right, of your own policy or aims, right, your goals, um, you know, of thinking as to why you want to create this work the things that you need as an individual, as an organization, right? Um, to be able to generate the work that you're interested in creating. 
And these are some examples of, of course, if we were in person, we would be screen printing these. You know, it's like, um, and there will come a time for that. Um, but because we're in this digital space together, right? Um, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna share a jam board with you all um, that will allow you all to see each other's work and then also um, kind of access it. And the only thing is that it only, I guess because it's free, it only lets me do like 20 of them. So there's going to there's going to be some digital negotiation happening, you know, as as we do this. But uh, here's the link for the Jamboard. These are different examples, right? Of uh, like this is something that I that I've been doing um, with teaching artists, with students, in 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 creating like rules for the classroom, right? And thinking about the way that we want to work together um, with with teaching artists, of course, right? And the things that we need to create this work. Um, and also in, in, in the teacher, teacher training program at UIC in really thinking about the, um, our ideal classrooms, right? That we, that we want for ourselves and for our students. So on those hard days where we're like, why are we doing this work, right? Especially right now, I think, you know, there's been so, it's been so, teaching has been so hard, just everything has been so hard you know, that this is also a reminder of the collective work that we're doing together, right? Um, so we're going to give you, um, we're going to give you about 15 minutes in these groups to think through some of these ideas, to, you know, engage in discussions with your, um, with your collective members, right? Um, and I want you to either create something for yourself collectively of things that you need. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is, as part of your groups, if you can assign one person or if you want to be that brave soul, right? Um, and then you'll just report back of, of just like giving us a, a small summary of the conversations that you all had. And then what I'll do is I'll share the resources. Um, I'm going to share some resources for you for the um, the, um, the Chicago Cultural Alliance um, curriculum that I got to generate um, last year. Um, I'm going to also share a, a Google folder with um, images that I've been using for a couple of different years. Um, you know, not they're not all like super well categorized, so you're going to have to excuse, but I will work through that. Um, and then I will also share um, just a Google folder for us to start generating and inputting cr different curriculum ideas. Then we will, you know, begin to explore during our second session on May 3rd. Great. So I just want to check in. Does anyone have any questions before we move into the breakout rooms? Can you all access the Jamboard okay? And I think... Um, Marilyn maybe has a question. I as did. Well. I did. I'm having trouble finding myself in the group, but you know, maybe that's a lifelong problem. So hello, everyone. Um, first of all, William, thank you. I that was um, such an inspiring and and heartfelt um, approach to this work. And my question is probably a little bit on the binary side, and I'm, and I'm sure the answer is somewhere in the middle, but I'm thinking about, I'm trying to extrapolate from the work we do here into something a little bigger. I'm thinking about working with a group of students who say, who decide that climate change, for example, is the issue that is close to their hearts but um, maybe polar bears are a lot more appealing than the toxic soil in their own neighborhood. And I guess the question for me is, as the teacher, sort of what becomes more important, that centrality of community and um, what, what has meaning in their own life day to day Mm -hmm. or where their own sort of heart is going um, as they look at 
as they look at these heartbreaking photos, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, Marilyn, I think part of, thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, it's like, so I think, I think that really depends on the relationship that you have with your students, you know, um, and, and also the amount of time that you have with them. You know, um, I think for that, what I would, what I would say, what I would suggest would be, you know, I think we have to start somewhere, right? Um, I think polar bears are like the easiest, <laughs> the easiest, the easiest accessible, right? For like to think about climate change, right? I think that's where, where like for me, the mind mapping helps depending on your, your, the age of your, of your students. This is where it's like, well, what are what are some of the different things where we see climate change, and what is the closest to the places that we live in, you know? Um, and I think that's where the the research and kind of the the thinking, you know, when I've done some of this work as well, Marilyn, like we will watch documentaries, right? We will watch documentaries that are not like too too like heartbreaking because that's also like really really deflating right um especially with younger students um but really thinking about what are some of the aspects that that we're responsible for but also like like how are our corporations how are like these larger systems engaging in um in these climate environments right um because i think that's the other thing too like sometimes you know, we've had multiple conversations about this of like, you know, is us changing from a plastic straw to a reusable straw really creating an impact when major corporations are dumping slough into our into our fresh water systems, right? Um, and and who is who's blamed, right? Like who's who's tasked with the responsibility of solving these problems, right? Um, and I think, you know, I think there's, at least for me, right, like, there's no right or wrong place for us to start accessing, accessing these conversations. But what I would say, it's, it's about like the continuity, right, of engaging in these discussions, and thinking about, well, what are the things that we're doing right now in our everyday lives to address climate change, right? Like, how can we do it as a city? How can we do it as a state? How can we do it as a nation? How can we do it globally, right? Um, so then the polar bears can only in, be engaged in one of those levels, right? But then we're also providing multiple opportunities for us to think about this problem through different lenses. Thank you. So I think I wanna make sure that everyone has time to discuss in the breakout rooms. I put the prompt in the chat there for you. William, remind me how long we're gonna be in there for again. Uh, we're gonna try, we're gonna do 15 minutes and then we'll do 15 minutes where we come back and share okay. like some of the discussions that happen in the, um, in the breakout rooms. Great. So we'll see you in about 15 minutes, everyone. Thank you. Should I go in a breakout room too for me? You can if you'd like, you don't have to. I just opened them all up so they yeah. automatically put you in. But if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. <clears throat> Hi, Shoshana. Hi, Annie. Hi. I just was um, like putting my excuses in the chat that I think I have to go because I was, you know, illegally doing this PD in the middle of supposed to be doing some other work. So. <laughs> Uh, but I appreciate you sharing your experiences so much, William. It's so good to hear your voice and see your face in real life, kind of, almost. almost yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great to know that you're here, Shoshana. Here, I'll give you a little, hey, <laughs> it's me, but old. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sending a big hug. <laughs> Take care, Shoshana. It's so good to see you. You too. Ooh, 
think everyone's in a room. Yeah, it looks like it. Ariel, are you here with us? Room two has a lot of people, but I didn't want to switch them once they were already in there. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. I just, uh, <laughs> so I, I did this thing with my computer with hot corners and my mute button is right by a corner. So I just like logged myself out of my computer <laughs> oh. right as I was trying to unmute myself to talk to you. And I'm so sorry at the beginning, I had the slides just suddenly stop sharing and I had to like reconfigure for a second. So I apologize for that at the top. I don't uh, think works. anyone noticed. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, William, this is so incredible. I feel like, it, you know, the, this is a, like a really kind of, um, like radical approach to learning, to teaching and learning in the sense that like, I love the way you're combining the imagery stream of consciousness, collective consciousness and really drawing on your deep experience and connection because it just, it makes it feel so much more like emotional and visceral. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really enjoying it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes I've, I've tried to write presentations and I like freeze up. Meta. You know, it's like, yes, uh huh. Meta. You know, it's like so. Then it's just like here, it's just like, okay, these are the these are the bullet points that I want to make sure I cover. Touch on, yeah. You know, so this that's why that like uh, schedule on the um, for the time session agenda for this like mm -hmm. is really really helpful. Good, good. I felt like we were kind of interacting too because I was like, yeah, this seems like the right spot. We're gonna flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love it. And then it's like <laughs> just going through that and like we, it's like the weaving, right? Like it was fun. Yeah. It's like the st the storytelling, the storytelling aspect of this. I felt like I was part of it a little bit. <laughs> oh, you and Ariel are definitely part of this. Yay. <laughs> this would have not happened if it were been for you two and our amazing cohort of collaborators because. I know. I, I remember. I was like. I was like. I think I know what I want to do. And then, like, engaging conversations. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's like, okay, now I have a sense of what I'm doing. You know. <laughs> yes. Nice. Yeah. yeah I mean, all that. Doing? All that artwork is so gorgeous. Yeah. Like it's incredible. Like the fact that you've documented and archived all of this honestly I was thinking like we could have just like have I mean that probably wouldn't make sense because then we would need permissions or whatever but like an exhibition of just like these experiences yeah. and collaborations with students so mm -hmm. yeah I have, I have so much documentation it's like it's ridiculous you know, mm -hmm. it's, I, but, and I've been getting rid of little by little. And, and now I was just like, no, like, why did I get rid of that image? <laughs> and you know, all of the stories, you know, the students, it's like incredible. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, but no, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what folks, what folks um, share back. And then also like curious to see about the second session, you know, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to send out some guidelines for developing their manifestos in between now and then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also thinking about, right, like what kind of curriculum do they want to co-generate? What kind of curriculum they want to, like if they want to come with curriculum that's already generated or mm -hmm. if we'll just use the time. I was also going to suggest if people wanted to like talk before May 3rd, if, if they were curious about ideas, but weren't sure like how to make those connections. Yeah, maybe we have like, we could even schedule an office hour so that you don't have to schedule like a bunch of different meetings. Yeah. But maybe mm -hmm. even like a check-in. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I do like those office hours, yeah. But that's what I worry about sometimes. I'm like, how am I gonna connect with all of these people? But if you like, you know, create a little bit of a time Mm -hmm. and if people don't come well at least they'll have we'll make sure they have the resources and tools and so mm -hmm. 
I'll bring the folks back in about 10 minutes. Okay, so 2.50 and then maybe we'll have like a couple of share outs. Does that okay. make sense? 2.50 sound right? Or two? Yeah. yeah. But that was about 15 minutes, I think. Marilyn's question was interesting. Yeah. But it happens a lot, right? It's just like the students tend to go to like the surface level, like well, that's what you were saying about bears the are big parts. That mm -hmm. was the whole point of that, because essentially you found the deeper layer there of how they were connecting that to their communities, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and the kind of Pokemon cards that they would create for that. So I feel yeah. like it's like the meeting of minds in, in a way. So depending on the age, like you said, and. Yeah. The other there. thing too is like that. Um, I mean, I didn't really talk about this one, but where where students were kind of wearing like animal, like kind of like mask, you know, mask. Mm -hmm. Like they 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 situated themselves with endangered species, like in, in species in Illinois, mm. and thinking about how the environment was affecting them. Right. You know, so wow. just like literally like placing themselves right. Like we look at an endangered species that's located here regionally and then research them think about the environment that they live in and be like well what what are some of the things that could be affecting their way of life right yeah i think it's like easy to underestimate students sometimes and think that it really we is stay at the surface level but like you know like you're saying and like students and youth have amazing insights and once you start discussing those things you'll see like those ideas and those thoughts emerge, like solutions that you never even imagined yeah. yourself, right? Like, so yeah, it can be super incredible. Yeah. yeah. And I think sometimes it's really like time, right? Like time and yeah. and building that trust, Especially both for your students to trust you and for you to trust your students sure to be like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do this together, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, Ariel and Courtney, what do y'all think? I was I was planning on sharing the links again, like specifically to the um, the Google folder right now. And be like, hey, these are some of the resources that I would like you to look at, think about, you know, as we're thinking through. Or should we email that later on? Or I think maybe um, we can. Uh... So in your folder, we can sort of co-draft an email that has the links that you want and sort of some like next steps. Okay. Um, and I'll also put the, the survey link in there. And then um, I can send that to all of the participants from today, like everyone who registered today. Okay. And then, um, and I'll also, Sort of come up with a schedule of reminders for them in okay. advance of the May 3rd session. I love that. That's great. Um, that's awesome. Carol, oh, when we get to the end, do you want to share out announcements for upcoming events or do you want me to do it? I just um, time, but I... I think you can do it because okay. my voice is still really just oh. everything yeah. is not feeling flowy no and i don't want everyone to be like was she taking a nap like why does she sound terrible <laughs> you can take a nap if you want to ariel <laughs> <laughs> i plan on taking a nap before i go get my partner I'm going to, I might have to squeeze in a nap also. <laughs> There's just been, there has been so much. Ooh, I know. So much going on. It's really the conference is like creating that extra layer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just try, kind of trying to like keep up with everything that I'm supposed to be doing for that. <laughs> Along with you know, my college students and everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oof. How many folks are you all expecting for that? I imagine that's well, a lot we of have folks. Like, I think almost 160 registered now. So by then, in a couple of weeks, we'll probably have like close to 300, I'm imagining. Wow. Yeah. But then, you know, 
the breakouts, people will be divided. And so I think last year, what we had like maybe 30 to 40 people in a room or maybe up to 50 in a session, I would say. Mm -hmm. but it, yeah, it so you get to reach even more people because that'll be times two. I mean, yeah. I would assume that someone wouldn't go to your session twice. I mean, maybe they would, maybe they're just like in love with William. But there are going to be a lot of teachers in that session also. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is also just going to be really great for teachers sort of rethinking their. Yeah. Their thing. Are you voguing over there, Courtney? <laughs> <laughs> I like your nail color, by the way. It's very it's nice. Come off, but thank you. It's like peeling on the sides. Too much information. I think. I'll have to edit this video. Right. <laughs> and I don't want to pause it because literally I always forget to press play again. So I was like, I'd rather just edit it. Yeah, it's easier to just edit the stuff out. Like it's easier yeah. to just delete. Yes. Well, I know folks were asking what will the the um, the recording be available later on for folks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. We're gonna have the recording for you. Yeah, I know specifically uh, Salome Chasnoff. She's a, do y'all know Salome? Actually, mm -hmm. she's, a, she's a filmmaker, but she teaches in uh, at SAC in the art education department. Oh, and she, she was asking to see if uh, she could show it as part of her class. Nice. Uh, it's recording yeah. now. She's like, is it recording? I was like, I have no idea. I was like, I oh, yeah. Totally <laughs> oh, yeah, we have a recording. Yes, absolutely. That's Awesome. Yeah, it'll be available on the YouTube channel, the engineering okay. YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I think it'll look good. Karen has hers up there already. Oh, I'm gonna see that. I didn't know we have. I didn't know. Is that through Ingenuity? Mm -hmm. Yes, Ingenuity Chicago. I think I made a constellation series but karen's is the only one up so far because she was the first one yeah and we have a lot it's gonna yeah. i'm so excited to see so i'm not gonna lie i was like a little bit irritated because i emailed some of my north park colleagues being like this would be a really good thing for you to go to and my area supervisor was like I'm teaching at that time. Will it be recorded? And then also, could you represent us? And I was that's just the like, issue too now with recordings. People are like, just sending the recording, and I get it. Like that's people really like independent learning, and I get because it, it fits their schedules. But then we miss that like, yeah, connection. You know, and right? And also, like I almost emailed them back and was like, if you want a recording, register. <laughs> well, right, exactly. Yeah. Because otherwise, like. And I mean, I get, you know, he's in class right now, but the whole, like, would you represent us? I'm like, no, I'm adjunct faculty. I have no control over curriculum. That is you all. We'll be creating some of those, like, you know, through IBL, the independent learning. Actually, William, I, we should probably talk to you about whether or not for next year, next school year, whether you'd be interested in, in creating um, Virtual like learning. Asynchronous virtual learning. Oh, there's someone in the waiting room. Were they here before or are they just like really coming in at the end? Um, I think they might have been here before. Okay. I'm going to close the breakout rooms actually. Hello, Eliza. Hi. <laughs> Where are you joining us from today? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm over in Cyprus, actually. <laughs> so that is far away. What time is it there? It's late. That's why it's um, it's uh, 10 to 10. Uh, wow. Ooh, it's so good to see you. It's so good to you i'm sorry i think i just missed most all of your talk but I just yeah we're, we're, we're getting close to close up yeah <laughs> sorry to interrupt
interrupt. I thought I would pop on and see if I could catch any. At least I get a hello. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, you're oh, it's so good to see you, Eliza. Breakout rooms right now. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll catch up with your uh, with the replay. I hope. All right. Sounds like a plan. Yay. Hi. Welcome back, everyone. Just waiting for a few folks to re-enter the room. Ah, so many awesome faces. Entering this dimension. How many breakout rooms were there, Courtney? There were four breakout rooms. Four breakout rooms. I think that everyone is back. Everyone's back. So as we're getting ready to close up shop, um, is there anyone that wants to share some of the discussions that happen in your breakout room? Is that awkward moment? Were the conversations easy to have? Were they challenging? Oh, Alexis. I can, yeah, I can share. <laughs> um, so some of the things that my group talked about, um, I was with Dana and Bella. And so um, we are all working and representing like performance art programs. And so some of the things we kind of shared um, that work um, aligned were that there's this need right now to one, understand what trust means. Um, and then with that, we're talking about thinking about when you enter a community or a classroom, you have to build trust. And so the trend that we're seeing now in our classrooms and programs is that there's a longer time to develop that trust just because um, all these different factors that have gone on. And so um, it's just kind of a little more encouraging to hear that, you know, this isn't a unique or independent experience and that a lot of students are, a lot of people also are taking a little more time to warm up to others. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is thinking about what, you know, the individual expectation is as a teaching artist. And then, um, also pairing that with the expectation of the program. And so I'm a program manager, but I was also in a group with, you know, someone who is a teaching artist. And so being able to share dialogue and feedback of there's this need as the teaching artist to have to kind of make adjustments in real time and um, that make more sense to the individual populations that always or might not always um, I don't know if this comes out right, but prioritize the program's curriculum in that moment, just because if we're thinking about serving the needs of the students, and that's why we're in this work, there's going to be a lot of adjustments and shifts that happen in real time. Thank you so much for that, Alexis. Yeah, and even just the, the, the flexibility, right, Alexis, of like being allowed to have that time to 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 figure out and develop what's the best way to develop that relationship and trust, right? And can we do that with like a three day program or a one day workshop, right? Like sometimes we just can't, right? Um, but thinking about where where are these opportunities, whether we're as teaching artists, like whether we're allowed to create these opportunities, whether whether are already kind of designed into the programming, right? Thank you. Is there anyone else I would like to share? Oh, I'll, I'll share. Thank you, Jonna. Yeah, um, just a couple of larger, um, as we talked about our experiences, um, one of the things was um, make the provocation for the students something where they can dream big and not have um, small expectations, but you know, larger expectations for themselves. 
but then at the same time understand that you know expectations and the plans may change as as the work starts to evolve in the classroom so that the artist um, functions oftentimes as a coach or consultant to where the students are taking the work. Does mm -hmm. that all make sense? Yeah. Um, using, using the Reggio, using a Reggio kind of construct. And then I, I mean, my feeling is like oftentimes there may be an idea that is initiated by the classroom teacher and the artist in their planning session, but you really need to understand that you need to go with the work and where it takes you. And that's both for the teacher, the artist, and the students. Thank you, Joanne. And not to, you know, and just to add on, not to feel like you failed because perhaps the goals and uh, the outcomes change. Mm. Thank you. I, you know, just re recently in the last like year and a half, I've been hearing this saying a lot of like move at the speed of trust. It's a right? great, um, you know, and which really shifts the way that we think about teaching, you know, um, and also, you know, in, in thinking about at, at being someone that has done, you know, coordinated programs with schools as well, right? Like thinking about like developing long-term relationships with our partners, right? And and understanding what their needs are, understanding our own needs, right? The needs of the teaching artists, needs of students. There's like a lot of needs to be met, right? And and the fact that like we won't always be able to meet everyone's needs, but thinking about how do we start building these opportunities for us to explore, right? What it is that we can do together. Um, because I, I think, you know, like um, Alexis and Joanne, you were, you were um, saying, right? Like, I think sometimes we're able to and sometimes we're not. Um, and like, how do we start creating these opportunities for both ourselves, for the students, for administrators, for the teachers, right? Like to start dreaming bigger about the possibilities of what we could do within our work. Um, with with the notion of that there's like the limitations as well of time of materials of in, interruptions to our to our learning as well right right and you know christina and tara were in my my group and christina actually addressed that she said you know really building a structure to meet the, the interests of the students and in the time that you have so but I, I think in a lot of ways, when you exit from a project, you will have students at different levels of completion and they should all be celebrated for what they, how they moved forward because everyone works at a different pace. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone else that would like to? closes off. I'll leave you with this uh, quote by Maxine Green. One of my many favorites. You know, and thinking about, you know, again, you know, I think we, you know, there's there's a a true focus on 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 student learning, right? And and I think that's always part of the work that we do. Um, but also thinking about thinking of our own learning, right? Creating opportunities for ourselves as teachers, as learners, to create these spaces for ourselves that will also model this work for our students, right? Because if we aren't, if organizations are not creating these spaces for us as teaching artists, as educators, if we are not creating these spaces for ourselves, then it's really hard to model that thinking and learning for the students that we're interested in, in collaborating with and engaging with, you know? So 
you know, as a teacher in search of their own freedom, maybe the only kind of teacher who can arouse young persons to go in search of their own, right? And it's impossible for me to say that this will happen with one interaction, right? Although sometimes it does, you know, but this is a, a constant work of progress. And I think the best way for us to start doing this work is to do it collectively, right? So um, what we'll do is, you know, we will share um, through an email later on that um, Ingenuity will send to you um, resources, curriculum that has been created that starts addressing some of these, these ideas and concepts. And then, you know, you will have a little bit of homework, right, to think about um, in, in preparation for the second part of this on, on May 3rd, um, where we will be collectively thinking through you know, how this curriculum might look like in your space for yourself, for the organization that you work with. Um, and then there will, there will also be some office hours, right, that I'll be creating so I can actually meet with folks who are interested in digging deeper into some of these conversations and to also just hang out, right, and talk <laughs> and connect, right, which is the part that brings a lot of joy to me in doing this work. So. All right, Courtney. Okay. Thank you so, so, so much for being here this afternoon and for joining us for today's session. Um, and just, you know, a really big thank you. And I just really want to celebrate William's approach to the delivery of this presentation, of the facilitation it really being an amazing um, kind of coming together of imagery, the collective consciousness, um, stream of consciousness, and obviously William's deep connection to um, arts education, to his students. I think it was very exemplary of all of that and kind of had a, more of an emotional thread for me, at least personally. Um, so part two of Rethinking Our Curriculum, as you know, will be taking place on May 3rd. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that. As William said, we'll reach out to you with some materials, with some tools, with an exit survey, a recording, um, and we'll set up some of those office hours for you to further connect with William. And then we ha also have a number of other upcoming events and constellation sessions taking place this spring. So I hope you're ready for that as well. Um, let me drop in, you know, and we'll follow up via email with these links as well, but I just wanna drop in upcoming registration or our events page on the Ingenuity website so you can register for any upcoming events. But we do have um, art look, partner office hours taking place on the 31st. So if, for instance, you have an Artlook account through your arts organization and you need some technical assistance with either logging in or how to use the platform, we'll be available for an hour on that day to assist you with any questions that you might have, provide some of that technical assistance once again. And we'll be scheduling those office hours for Artlook or any other questions that you have um, a little bit more regularly as well. And then on April 8th, we have the 2022 Arts Education Conference. Um, that will be a virtual conference. It will be taking place from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Um, it'll bring together school, educate, school arts educators, teaching artists, arts organizations, principals, administrators um, from all over the sector to really um, deepen, provide a space to deepen our understanding of culturally responsive education. And um, William will also be joining us to present a session at that conference. So we hope you'll be able to attend that. And then we have a number of other constellation institutes coming up in the spring from this cohort of amazing arts educators, teaching artists and administrators. So um, let's see, on April 12th, 12th, we have youth-centered art making spaces and envisioning a continuum of care that will be presented by Michael Rangel. Then on April 20th, 
We'll have part two of Healing Centered Engagement in the Arts um, presented by Karen Shiflett from Changing Worlds who joined us today. Shout out to Karen. Um, and then on April 28th, we have Building Responsive Arts Programs through Co-Creation and Civic Practice and that will be presented by Fifth House Ensemble. And then on May 3rd, as you know, we'll be back here for Rethinking Our Curriculum Part 2, um, Sharing and Resources, May 3rd. So um, we hope to see you all then. Once again, you can register for all of those sessions at the link I dropped in the chat, and we'll also send out an email with some of those updates as well. Um, so much gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much for being here and, and continuing to learn together and collaborate during this time. We know it's challenging. We know you have a, a million, a multitude of things that you're always doing and up against. And so we thank you for your time and for your energy. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to seeing you on May 3rd, if not sooner. <laughs>